asking us, uh, but it's my job in particular to welcome uh, Paul. Uh, I'm not sure how I describe you. You're one of, one of the eminent socio-economists of our time. I um, hope that's not too small. Anyway, um, Paul's been director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies since 2011 and is a visiting professor at UCL. Uh, he's published uh, and broadcast extensively on the economics of public policy, including tax, welfare, inequality, pensions, education, climate change, and public finances. Uh, he has authored major books on pensions, tax, and inequality. Uh, he previously worked at the FSA and has been Chief Economist at the Department of Education and Director of Public Spending in NHM Treasury, as well as Deputy Head of the UK Government Economic Service. I don't know how he really did it all. <laughs> um, he is currently a member of the Council Executive Committee of the Royal Economic Society, a member of the Climate Change Committee, a member of the Banking Standards Board, and is on the board of the Office of Tax Simplification. He has previously served on the Council of the Economic and Social Research Council and was founder council member of the Pensions Policy Institute. He has led reviews of the policy of auto enrolment into pensions for the DWT and of price statistics for the UKSA. <clears throat> Neither he nor I know precisely how the title of his speech arose. Uh, I deny having coined it, as does he, but I said to him, um, plenty of latitude, but anyway, he is going to speak about one of the main pension issues of our age, too expensive to keep, is it a time to break our powers, break our promises to the older generation. Paul, over to you, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much for that, um, that introduction, and thank you all very much for coming and, uh, and inviting me here uh, this evening. Um, I feel I should actually start by um, uh, following Tim and saying, of course, if you really want to make donations, the IFS is a much better, <laughs> much better bet than, the, uh, than anywhere else for, uh, for support. Um, but I can see that as it may. Um, the topic, um, wherever it came from, um, is, uh, is one that I have been thinking about quite a lot, which is this question of um, whether we should be keeping our promises to the uh, older generation. Um, actually, what we mean by promises is something that I want to think about, uh, and uh, and so why uh, why is that um, a question at the moment? It's a very big thing, isn't it, for a government or a, a private institution to break any kind of uh, promise uh, or contract. But I suppose the question is, what do we mean by those promises and contracts, and under what circumstances might you think it's appropriate to? renege or uh, move away from uh, what you thought you had agreed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by laying out uh, the situation as I see it in terms of the distribution of income and wealth, particularly between generations, but also more broadly. I'm then going to say something about why I think it matters. It's not actually obvious. Uh, and then I'm going to say something about uh, what, uh, what the policy framework might be thinking about. So let, let, let me start off by talking about distribution, because of course what we're talking about here is who, who has what and why. And the place to start, I think, is to say that if we're talking about the distribution of income across the population, for 98 or 99% of the population that has not shifted in a quarter of a century. The Gini coefficient, the way we normally measure inequality, income inequality, is the same now as it was in 1990. And actually, the 90-10 ratio, the difference between the income of someone 90% of the way up the income distribution and 10% of the way up, is lower now uh, than it was in 1990. So if you look across most of the income distribution over a quarter of a century, there's just no action, actually. Um, there is action, or there was action at the top, the top 1% whose share of income rose uh, steadily through the 1990s and up to about 2010. But actually, if you look over the last five years, unequivocally, the income distribution has narrowed, not widened. But that's clearly not the perception. That's clearly not where the public debate um, is. Uh, and I want to say partly in, in my comments, kind of comment on why I think that public debate, that public perception is different from the reality, and how that actually also relates to what's been happening to distribution between generations. Of course, part of what's happened over the last 
eight or nine years is that among the working age population there has been uh, stagnation uh, in living standards and stagnation uh, in incomes. So that's clearly part of what's going on, uh, but it's by no means um, all of what's been going on. I should say, uh, by way sort of a, a final bit of um, preface, which is that while I'm going to talk about uh, differences between generations, don't forget that differences within generations are clearly much bigger. The average, the, the averages between generations are much closer than the rich pensioner and the poor pensioner, or the rich person of working age and the poor. So, so what's the background in terms of why uh, what's been happening to incomes at different ages? And let's start with um, uh, older people, pensioners, uh, and with what I think is probably the biggest social policy triumph of my lifetime, uh, which is what's happened to the incomes of people over pension age. When I first started work in this area, which was in the 1980s, pensioners were hugely more likely to be poor than any other group in society. In the early 1980s, uh, more than a third of pensioners were in, officially in poverty. They were more than three times as likely to be poor uh, as were people um, of working age. We were known throughout Europe and probably more widely as uh, a dreadful place to be pensioner. Today, the reverse is true. Pensioners are only half as likely uh, as people in their 30s, for example, to be in poverty. We have not fully solved pensioner poverty, but it has come down to an absolutely astonishing extent. It's Trump. Um, at that, so for that same period, obviously, as you'd expect, given what I've just described, pensioner, the incomes of pensioners have risen as well, certainly over the last 25 years, the incomes of pensioners have risen relative to the incomes of people of working age every single year for the last uh, 25 mm. years. Um, back in the early 1980s, the average income, the median income of a pensioner was 30% less than the median income of, some, of, of, of people across the rest of the population. Something astonishing happened in 2011. In 2011, on the standard measure of income that uh, the government uses, uh, taking down family size and housing costs, pensioner incomes, I'm not talking about wealth, pensioner incomes rose to be higher than the average incomes of people uh, across the rest of the uh, population. Something's never happened before in history uh, in, uh, in, in, in this country. So we've had something, I mean, that's quite extraordinary. And um, what does that tell you? I mean, just think about that. If, pension, if the incomes of people at 65 now, and people at 65 are significantly richer than people at 80, so I'm taking the average across the pension population. Of people. The incomes of people at 65 now are significantly higher than the average, than the incomes of people who are 30 and 40 now, and they are significantly higher. What does that mean about how they relate to the incomes of those same people who are 65 now uh, to earlier in their working life? And the answer is that the large majority of people retiring now are significantly better off than they were on average during their working life. Now, again, that is astonishing. And that's kind of obvious from the statistics I've just given you, but we've also looked at the IFS at this very specifically, and so about 70 or 80 percent of pension people are retiring today on incomes which are higher than the average that they had over their working life. And that's partly because clearly 40 years ago um, living standards were much uh, lower, but uh, but it, it, it's a lot more it's a lot more than that. And again, it's um, it, it's something entirely new, and I think entirely um, unexpected. Uh, <coughs> Um, why? What's, what, 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 what is the reason uh, for this uh, phenomenal increase in, in incomes of people retiring today? Um, I'll say a bit more about each of these later on, but I mean there are three big reasons. One, probably the, the most important in, getting, in reducing poverty, but one of the less important ones in terms of increasing incomes has been increases in benefits. Two kinds of increases. First, the maturation of the of CERT or the state second pension uh, and uh, increasing numbers retiring on a full basic state pension, that's one uh, part of that, and then increases in means tested benefits significantly uh, brought about by the last Labour government. Secondly, and more important in moving, uh, moving people at 65 and beyond into the higher echelons of the income distribution has been occupational pensions, particularly the fine benefits pensions, which are probably close to their apogee um, at the moment. A large fraction of people are retiring with a, a reasonably significant amount of occupational pension. And I'm going to say quite a lot more about occupational pensions in a minute. And the third reason is, of course, housing costs or housing. So uh, something like 70 plus percent of people in their 60s 
uh, are owner occupiers and their housing costs, relative to the housing costs of people in their 20s and 30s, are much lower than they would have been in the past. And again, if you look back in the 1970s and 1980s, a large fraction of pensioners were still rented, and that's, uh, that's changed um, very dramatically. And we've um, done modeling, we, we, we can actually look forward as well, um, relatively easily, five or ten years, because we know quite a lot about people who are 55 now, and what their pensions are, and what their uh, work uh, experience has been, and so on. And it's pretty clear, and again, we've done some very careful work on this, it's pretty clear that this state of affairs will persist for at least another ten years or so. Actually, on top of all of that, uh, we also have an increasing fraction of people in their late 60s who are uh, earning uh, some uh, in, in the labour market um, as well. So I'm not really just talking, I mean, in, in terms of which generation am I talking about, I'm not actually really talking about pensions. I'm probably people between the ages of 55 <laughs> and 75, say, as the, the baby boomers, as the, the generation that I talk about, have really done very well. So I'll come on to say a little bit more about the background for that in a moment. So that's, um, that's the older generation. What about, what about younger people? Um, well, I mean, across the working age population, wages today are roughly the same as they were back in 2008. Um, and the wages of people in their late 20s are significantly below where they were uh, in 2008. We've never had a period like that, actually. And wages uh, and household incomes today are only a very small amount above where they were 10 uh, or 12 years ago. And again, since the 1940s at least, we have not had a period, uh, a comparable period of lack of growth um, in incomes. And in particular, we have not had a period in which the incomes of people in their 20s and early 30s today are lower than the incomes of people in their 20s and early 30s a decade ago. And that's where we are um, with respect to that, uh, with respect to that generation. Now, that, of course, may just be a blip associated with the, uh, with the recession and the very slow recovery from it. And it is possible that wages will start to grow more quickly and that blip will be overcome. And that this is not, you know, in a sense, we wouldn't necessarily get too excited about the long-run consequences of uh, a poor start in the labour market. But I think there are other reasons to be concerned about that younger generation relative to the old one. I mean, the first is that essentially nobody in that generation outside of the public sector has a defined benefit occupational pension scheme. I think it's 2% of people in their 20s uh, who are in the private sector. And, uh, and, that's, and that's 2% of um, So if you're outside of the public sector, you will not have a defined benefit occupational pension. And the amount that you will be saving in any kind of defined contribution scheme is vastly less uh, than in, in the defined benefit scheme. And indeed, it is simply in, inconceivable uh, that the amount you will save in that will be anywhere near the average that those who are retiring with defined benefit pensions uh, have got. So, so one reason that I'm worried about this um, is that I think there's a long-term, there, there is for sure a long-term change in, in pension provision. The second is about home ownership. Uh, we've seen an astonishing change in home ownership over the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, each generation was more likely to be a homeowner uh, than the generation before. From uh, the 1980s onwards, the reverse has been true. People at 30, age 30 now are half as likely as people <laughs> aged 30, 20 years ago to be a homeowner. That's an astonishing change and an astonishing reversal um, in, uh, in, 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 in the way that uh, in, in the way that wealth is accumulated. But here's the thing. This is where I think that uh, you, you, you've got uh, an impact of home ownership and um, perceptions on perceptions of inequality. So if you're in the middle of middle middle fifth of the income distribution today, you've got children. So your family with children, in the middle fifth of the income distribution, about half of you will be renting. Which makes you look much more like the bottom of the income distribution, where about two thirds are renting. But it does the top of the income distribution, where virtually everyone is an owner occupier. Whereas if you look back 20 years, in that middle bit of the income distribution, you had about 70%, 75% um, who were owner occupiers. So you move to a situation in which, because of what's been happening in the labour in, in, in the housing market, you've got a situation in which people in the middle of the income distribution will feel, all of my posit, more like people towards the bottom uh, than people towards the top. Whereas 20 years ago, 
they may well have felt more like people towards the top in particular because of their pension and housing status. And that is very closely related to the issues which, uh, which we're talking about um, this evening in terms of where the wealth and the income uh, lies. The other thing to think about with respect to younger generations is first, pension, state pension promises have actually been cut back. The um, single tier pension introduced by the coalition government, which I think was a, an excellent innovation, got cuts through a lot of, at least it will eventually cut through a lot of the complexities uh, of SERPs and state second pensions, will be less generous uh, to people retiring in 2030 and beyond than what was previously planned. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, the experience of SERPs and getting rid of it has been a fascinating one in terms of public policy. The, the history of pension policy in the UK since 1978 was, SERPs was introduced in 1978 and we spent 35 years unintroducing it and the last person affected will probably <laughs> die in about another 50 years. It's been, you know, the, 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 the disaster that was the introduction of SERPs has kind of um, uh, over, over, uh, underpinned pretty much everything that's happened in state pension policy since. So that's what's happening on state pension and then add to that I think is the kind of killer blow, as it were, for young people, is what's happening to interest rates. Historically, real interest rates have been 3 or 4%. Real interest rates are 3 or 4%. You can save a reasonable amount and expect to get half or two-thirds of your income in retirement. With real interest rates at zero or below, you just can't. It's just not possible. You have to save more than half of all of your income to get a reasonable replacement rate in retirement. Now again, this may be a blip, let's hope it's a blip, but it's been a pretty long blip already of um, zero interest rates for six or seven years, and it looks like they're gonna go on for another three or four years and maybe longer. So saving uh, through that is, um, is looking like a long run, a long run issue. So what underpins all of these difficulties and the differences between um, the generations? Well, let me say something briefly about um, housing and then something briefly about defined benefit pensions. I'm actually not going to say very much about state pensions. I mean, we kind of, you know, we know the process through which state pensions are, are created. And actually, they're not the big issue. I mean, we often focus a lot on state pensions, but they're not the big issue in terms of the difference between, uh, between generations. And I can, I'm happy to take questions on any of this and explain why I think that later. So what's been happening with housing? Well, first of all, clearly, um, relative lack of supply, relative lack of building um, of housing, which means that there's not much available for uh, younger uh, generations. But it really isn't just that. There's also been uh, built into our housing policy is a tax system which benefits people already in substantial houses. Council tax under taxes big houses and over taxes small houses. Stamp duty. Um, which is possibly the worst design tax we have against significant competition. Um, stamp duty uh, pretty much ensures that people don't move house when, when they could and therefore grinds the housing market to a halt. And all of that impacts on exactly this distribution between those who already have and those who don't yet have. And then of course there's monetary policy which has benefited in terms of asset values, those who already own assets, and benefited in terms of interest rates, those who already have a mortgage but has not helped at all people in their 20s who want to move on to the housing ladder because it brought the uh, price up. So, um, so housing, uh, that's what underpins, I think, this generational divide in housing. And then in defined benefit uh, pensions, what's, what's happened there? Well, a lot of what's happened there, I think this is true in housing as well, is that a lot of what's happened has been essentially unintentional, but what is a defined benefit pension? It's not defined benefit in the sense of the value of the benefit. It's a defined benefit in the sense of the amount, essentially in pounds, or a fraction of your final income. We will give you from a certain age. Now, longevity has increased by about nine years over the last 30 years, longevity at age 60. Uh, and that pretty much increased by 40% or 30 or 40% of the value of the pension relative to what was expected because this increase in longevity was not expected. You look back at government actuary reports. So if you look back in the 1970s, they were bringing their life expectancy down, not up, um, over the next 30 years. It was, must have been, I don't remember very well, it must have been a pretty miserable decade. Um, uh, so we, we, we've been take, taken, um, taken by surprise by what's happened to longevity. 
Returns in the stock market in particular have been lower since 2000 than they were in the preceding 20 years. And a lot of the promises in occupational pensions, defined benefits, were never actually intended as absolutely firm promises, but regulation has moved them towards being um, firm uh, promises. So we never intended things to be uh, quite so um, uh, quite so expensive. We never intended, I don't think the regulators and the politicians and the legislators and certainly the people who put together occupational pensions ever intended to be quite so generous or so <coughs> expensive. And my view is it as a policy, it's just a po plain policy mistake. A plain policy mistake to base your entire system on something that was not defined in terms of its cost or its value, but absolutely promised in terms of something whose cost and value could exponentially increase as it has. Uh, and yet the promise, it is a promise, it is a contractual promise, the promise um, was there. Now why um, does that uh, matter? Well partly because this is significantly where you're looking at the fine benefit pensions and the housing market at the expense again of the younger generation. Now, the difficult thing here is, and there may well be people here who are benefited from occupational pensions themselves, those receiving them didn't pay for them. They feel like they paid for them, they put, put contributions in year by year, but those contributions had ex post turned out to be nowhere near enough to pay the pensions actually uh, in payment. With the result that, um, private firms who still have occupied defined benefit schemes are putting in 30 or 40 billion pounds a year into these schemes. That money comes from somewhere. It probably comes in cost of lower contributions to the defined contribution pensions of younger, uh, younger employees. It may come, there's some evidence for this, in, in lower earnings. It probably comes in lower uh, investment and lower uh, dividends than would otherwise have been the case. The key thing here is uh, that these costs are very substantial in economic terms. Um, and have to come, uh, and have to come from, uh, come from somewhere. So we've got a situation in which, entirely, I think, you know, without uh, unintentionally, we have set up the housing market. We've set up the tax system on housing. We've set up the tax system on pensions. We've set up the occupational pension system in a particular way, which, by happenstance, has benefited a particular generation, and importantly, at the expense of the next generation. Um, and, you know, that might be fine. As I said, the distribution within generations is greater than the distribution between. We can live with unfairnesses and inequities and, thing, and so on, and there is clearly a huge value in keeping to promises and contracts. But I just want to introduce one other reason why I think all of this matters, and that's because I think worries me most is the, what the long-run implications of this are for the next generation. So who, currently in their 20s, will occupy expensive housing uh, in London and have a good standard of living in their 60s? It's not, on the whole, going to be those who earned it through, um, through their life, because they're simply not going to be able to save enough to do that. It will, on the whole, be those who have inherited from the previous um, generation. And again, we've done work on this at the IFS, showing quite clearly that expectations of inheritance through the generations are changing um, and increasing, and clearly uh, that um, you, it, it's just it's not credible to think that you'll be able, uh, through your own saving, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to, to be occupying expensive housing and uh, having generous pensions later on. So as a matter of, so as a result of concentrating income and wealth in one generation, unequally between that generation. I fear that we move to uh, the Duke of Westminster's um, advice when asked how to, you know, how to, how to do well. He said, have, uh, um, have an ancestor who was a good friend of William the Conqueror. Well, it's, um, uh, it's, right, it's increasingly, I fear, similar because of the way uh, that, we're, um, uh, that we're concentrating entirely, as I say, unintentionally income and wealth in a particular way. <coughs> will move back towards that kind of, um, that kind of uh, situation. So, so that's why I think this is a worry which goes beyond um, a concern about uh, the relativities between um, current generations, which is a concern we may well uh, be able to, to live with. I think it has longer term consequences than that. So let me, uh, let, let, me, let me come on then to the second theme of 
my talk, which is about what we mean when we talk about promises and contracts and reasonable expectations. So all of what I said may be absolutely true, and you may agree with me or you may not, but you may well equally say, well, that's all fine, but actually there are a set of promises here, and uh, people, have, have people who own their houses and have their occupational pensions and so I've done so entirely legitimately and have entirely planned their lives around that and that, that has to be, that has to be sacrosanct. And I agree with that to a very large, uh, to a very large uh, extent. Um, uh, but, um, but what do we mean by these commitments in public policy? Well, the first thing to say is that no commitment in the end is ever or can ever be um, absolute. The government has broken promises, and I don't mean manifesto promises, I mean the sorts of promises we're talking about here. So, if you retired in 1980, my goodness, you have a huge apparent promise broken, because up until 1980, the state pension was broadly indexed in line with earnings, and then for 30 years it went up in line with prices, and so over your 30 years in retirement, you would have got only, I don't know, the number about half possibly of the pension you might have expected to get. That's a big broken promise. But it was you might think it was a terrible thing to do, but it was clearly within the ambit, or felt to be within the ambit of reasonable uh, policy. Um, the state pension age is being increased, and it's being increased as we speak for women from 60 to 66 by 2020, and for men it will go to 66 in 2020, and for both it will rise thereafter. Well, that's off the back of contributions through the national insurance system, which people might reasonably have expected were uh, going to offer them a pension act, a pension age as it was legislated um, in the past. And again, I can't speak for everyone here, that seems to be entirely within the reasonable ambit of public policy to increase pension ages and not wait for 45 years until everyone who's currently in the labour market has gone through uh, to the end. So there is some breaking promises going on there and it seems to me that that's entirely within the ambit of reasonable policy. Uh, I spent as, uh, as, 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 as Howard said, um, uh, a few years, seven years, I think, in the civil service. Um, and while I was in the civil service, I was earning um, uh, what remains after 30 years of work, the main part of my pension, um, even after seven years. Um, but it's now worth a lot less than I was promised, because the government, again, I think reasonably, actually, um, said that rather than increasing my um, uh, accrued rights in line with the retail prices index, it will go up in line with the consumer prices index uh, from whatever year it was, 20, uh, 2011. That, that, has a sub signif that will have a significant effect on the value of public service pensions. That's actually, by value, easily the biggest change that's been made to public service, uh, public service pensions. It means I will get less when I retire than I might otherwise have expected to do. Um, and again, that feels um, you know, annoying for me, but you know, not uh, wholly reasonable. So that's one set of promises where actually we have seen, I think, within what a lot of people consider the reasonable ambit of policy in the areas I'm talking about, promises changed or broken. But I think more generally we need to be very careful about what we mean here. So um, again, we might not like it, but we think, I think, on the whole that it's reasonable for governments to increase or reduce income tax rates or VAT rates. Well, I make my decisions today on some sort of expectation about what tax rates might be tomorrow, how much I might be able to afford with my earnings or my, my savings, but that doesn't mean the government can't make uh, any, uh, any changes. Um, in some sense, everything the government does has some kind of, uh, some kind of implied uh, future contract about it. What I take from this actually is the gradual change um, uh, in around quite a wide area should be feasible. Sudden change, doubling the basic rate of tax or uh, you know, huge increases in VAT or suddenly halving everyone's pension rights is clearly beyond the pale. Uh, but gradual change to pension ages or to VAT rates or to income tax rates, particularly with uh, you know, in a democracy, seems to be not beyond uh, the pale. It provides it. There is some uncertainty there. I think uncertainty is unavoidable. And actually, we've had more uncertainty in some areas than I think is necessary or reasonable. So if you look at the way in which contributions to pension schemes are taxed, that's changed almost every year, I think, for the last eight years. 
Now, what's been interesting there has been that the rights of people who have already accumulated a pension have been absolutely protected. But the rights of people who actually wanted to accumulate a pension and were planning on accumulating a pension have not been protected at all. I guess my key point is here is I don't think those things are so distinct. Both of those things matter. But it doesn't seem to need to be fine to say to people, somebody who's 30 or 40, look, you might have been expecting to save a lot tax-free tomorrow, but you can't. Um, and that's fine. Uh, to say to someone who's 60 or 65, um, we will never ever touch anything about the pension that you've accumulated in the past. Those things are on a continuum. They are not as different, anything like as different, I think, as the public policy debate uh, would perhaps normally um, well, allow. Um, and I think part of the issue here is that this relates to the way that we think about public policy and um, what we are entitled to. Like we've moved to a world um, in many of these areas where there is a sense that I am entitled to X, Y, or Z. It's very obvious in defined benefit pension schemes. So when people were accumulating these things back in the 1980s, uh, they uh, actually, the, 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 the law and the legislation allowed a reasonable amount of flexi flexibility in terms of the use of employers. Unfortunately, some people like Mr. Maxwell took that rather too far, uh, to put it mildly. And in uh, understandable, uh, but extremely expensive um, response to that, regulation tightened, tightened what were reasonable expectations into legal entitlement. Um, but more generally, uh, we clearly have uh, not just a generation, but actually a, um, you know, a world in which people feel uh, a set of rights and entitlements to all sorts of things, whether that be to uh, winter fuel allowances, or whether that be to the occupational pension they've earned, or whether that be to uh, not having their house taxed more than it is now, or whether it be to free education, or free higher education, or low taxes. And of course you can't have entitlements to all of these things. These are mutually incompatible. <coughs> And that's why, again, we, it seems to me we need to balance these things. And in a, uh, you know, in a, uh, sort of a more ideal world, in which one felt some kind of trust, that's an important word, in the institutions which were running these things, whether that be the trustees, that's why they're called trustees of occupational pension schemes, or governments, to, as it were, within reason, change rules but allow such that uh, uh, change rules and change benefits in response to the world changing around them, so that these are seen as reasonable expectations managed by trusted institutions to preserve some kind of social cohesion. Um, that might be rather a good outcome, but where, where we are is one in which, unless something is defined in law, it feels to me like we have no trust in it. Um, and so we move from a world in which you have um, defined benefit schemes and uh, SERPs and things like that, which offer in potentially some flexibility in what, in what you get, but risk sharing across and between uh, generations, to a world in which I hope my defined contribution pension is pretty much absolutely by right to mine, uh, but I bear absolutely all of the risk on that defined who is in this world least able to bear risk, and particularly the scale of risk that you have in, in pensions, it's the individual who bears it all, it's the individual where 20 years ago was the risk held, actually a combination of employers, government, uh, and, the, and the individual. So I worry that this sense of entitlement and this bifurcation between either it's an absolute entitlement or it's nothing uh, has moved us to this world of absolute uh, entitlement and the costs of that, it seems to me, are potentially uh, really rather, um, really rather substantial. Um, and you know, how we move from that, I, I, I'm not sure. So, so, what, 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 so, so, so let, let me wind up by um, saying something about where this might take us in terms of at least the sorts of things that we might want to, um, we might want to consider. As I said, within the context of what I'm talking about. We've already moved to a world in which um, significant uh, uh, expectations and promises have been broken, whether it be state pension age, whether it be uh, public service pensions. Um, and I don't, I'm not, not focused on things like winter fuel allowances and free bus travel and so on. These may be important, but uh, those are things that 
um, uh, people have talked about far too much, given the scale um, of them, which is small. Um, so, what about housing? Well, here I think perhaps the, you know, at least conceptually, the answers are easier. As clearly as I've said, issues around the supply of housing, there's clearly issues around the taxation of housing. And uh, I can speak at length about how we might want to change the way the council tax works and the way the stamp duty works. It's interesting, isn't it, though, that um, the one change that we have had from the Chancellor, um, the previous Chancellor now, uh, on the taxation of housing was restricting uh, tax relief on buy to let properties. Now, uh, so he, um, you know, he, in his budget speech, I can't remember the last budget or from the state, he said that, the, 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 that by, by restricting tax relief on buy to let um, housing, he was helping to even up the playing field uh, between rental and owner occupied housing. That's completely wrong. That's economic nonsense. It remains the case that uh, over occupied housing is significantly more advantaged by, uh, by the tax system. Um, but I suspect that's not why he did it. I suspect why he did it, I don't know, I don't see into his mind, was, was this sense of unfairness in the sense that actually you know, all these younger people renting, and they're renting from somebody, actually quite often they're renting from older people who happen to have the, uh, the wherewithal to buy uh, these houses. And what I think he was trying to do was kind of, in a very, very cat-handed way, kind of create some more, um, uh, some kind of equity between the generations by hitting, uh, by hitting those um, who were owning these houses. Now, actually, that's not the right way to go about it at all. The right way to go about it, as I said, is to think much more seriously about stamp duty and council tax and, uh, and supply of housing. But I think it's interesting that the, that the pressure of the kinds of um, intergenerational uh, issues that I'm talking about is pushing politicians actually I think the bad solutions rather than no solutions at all. Um, so that's one option, one series of options which is kind of I think, in the, within the general remit of what we think about in terms of policy. I've already talked about the fact that public service pension indexation has moved from, uh, moved to, from RPI to CPI. That's not happened in the private sector. Uh, for reasons that I think are incomprehensible, but well, I mean, completely comprehensible, it's to do with you know, the law. But um, uh, the, um, you know, it's still the case that most um, occupational pensions in the private sector are indexed on the re retail prices index. Now, there, there, are, there are two problems with that. One, the old retail prices index is just wrong, it's completely wrong, and it significantly overstates um, inflation. Um, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of these schemes have, have it in the rules that, um, that, that things will go up with the retail prices index. But then these rules were written, and the retail prices index basically just meant inflation. We now have a plethora of measures of inflation, and we have a measure uh, which we know is better, which is the CPI. Um, and if we move to the CPI, that would save a, uh, a very large, a very <coughs> large sum of money, um, and achieve um, and achieve some of the intergenerational change that I'm. Describing now, now that would be quite clearly where it says in the rules that we will index it with the RPI. That would clearly be taking um, taking away uh, a reasonable a reasonable expectation, a promise from those who have accumulated um, fire benefit uh, pensions. And of course, you know, this is one of the things the government was. I don't know whether it still is thinking about in the context of British Steel and the Tartar Steel pension scheme as a way of helping that out of the hole uh, that the company is in. And I think that's, that is one illustration, or only one, one, one stark illustration, of the choices that sometimes perhaps need to be made between, um, uh, between, between one thing, which is keeping promises to uh, those in the pension scheme, and another, which is keeping, um, uh, uh, keeping jobs and investments um, going. So that's another area which I think is at least ought to be open for uh, discussion. A third one. Um, you know, like one could talk a lot about inheritance, but I think there's a particular issue about the way that defined contribution pensions uh, are treated uh, for inheritance tax. Actually, obviously, the money you put into a defined contribution pension is free of tax. You expect to pay tax when you take it out, but if you die, uh, certainly before age 75, then there's no tax even uh, on, the, on, on the inheritor of that afterwards. Uh, and that seems to me to be you know, actually both a constraint on more sensible policy making in terms of the taxation of pensions more generally, 
uh, but also something that one might want to, to look at. And then, and then finally, and perhaps most controversially, um, we know that uh, most contributions into these occupational pensions that we're talking about come from employers, at least formally. And there's a reason why they formally come from employers. That's because if you put money in as an employer, there's no national insurance contribution on the money that goes in. There's no national insurance contribution on the money that comes out at the end. It's absurdly generous in terms of national insurance contribution treatment. I actually think the tax treatment pension generally makes sense. You, you don't pay tax on the way in. You do pay tax when it comes out. That makes sense. That's, of course, the bit that's been, uh, get, you know, we're, we're losing. The bit that doesn't make sense, which is you pay no national insurance contributions at any point ever, um, seems to be not to make sense, and of course it's not seen any change at all. I mean, that's the, seems to be the, um, you know, what happens when you get into tax, you kind of think that something's right and it never happens. Um, but, the, um, but, but one thing that uh, you know, one could at least consider is that for people of earning with incomes above a certain amount who are receiving defined benefit pensions, you could add one or two P of national insurance surcharge on the pension in payment. Now, again, that would not be popular. Uh, I can understand why politicians wouldn't want to do it, but actually, in principle, as a tiny or policy change, that doesn't seem to need to be very different from increasing uh, VAT in particular, which clearly hits people who are, you know, um, spending their money, who are in retirement, and may well be, uh, in some sense, uh, more, uh, more, uh, more acceptable to the population at large. So, let me say, I'll finish off by saying, those are certainly some of the sorts of things I think we should be talking about. I, to make clear, I'm not saying we should do any of those things, but I am saying we should think about doing those things, and we should not um, simply say that because there is this set of things which are promises, uh, they must never be touched, and there are this other set of things which is the rest of the tax and spending system, we can do what we like with it. Things are just not that binary, and they're not because they're not that binary, we need a much more serious discussion and debate about which ones of those um, we can change. So, my three big points of substance, I think, are first, there, there has been um, a very fortunate generation um, economically. And secondly, in part that's absolutely brilliant because that has done huge wonders for reducing pension poverty and for increasing the living standards of an important part of the population. But actually, in part, it reflects a whole host of unintended consequences and unintended redistribution and actually costs on other people, someone else has had to pay in a very untransparent way uh, for that benefit. Uh, and thirdly, the long-term consequences of this in terms of inequality within subsequent generations is potentially um, very big indeed. So in that context, actually widening the scope of debate about what is a reasonable set of policies um, uh, about what, which we should debate, we need to respect rights and expectations clearly <coughs> Change, if we want to make change of the kinds that I've been describing, needs to be gradual. But that's true, I think, of most change in, um, in, 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 in government policy, if it's not to really upset legitimate uh, expectation. But we do need to recognise, I think, that the, the language of absolute entitlement actually fits neither any reasonable way of running public policy, nor actually as a description of how, at least in some areas, it actually is run. So, um, this is difficult stuff, without doubt, but I hope I've at least persuaded you that a debate of some kind is needed. Well, I, I can think of all sorts of questions, and having been born in 1948, <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. May I just ask? May I make, just make one point? Um, it seems to me there's an element of sort of the invisible hand in terms of how long people work. Um, I have no intention of stopping working until I think I'd be bored. Uh, and more and more people are working longer, sometimes for money, sometimes for uh, uh, company. Um, I, I remember reading that if you, if you took over the last decade of GDP, created by those working over 6, more people working over 65, it's equal to the total growth of GDP in that period. So it's pretty substantial. Isn't it actually a good thing, in some ways, that there is uh, like an economic stick rather than carrot, uh, perhaps both, but uh, economically we, we will need people if they go to, to 100, to 
it doesn't work out the way up to limit. Second quickie, the one thing I can't rationalize is the extent to which house prices have increased. I mean, it is just colossal in real terms over my lifetime. And uh, yes, scarcity is the key thing, uh, but you know, there are costs associated with housing, and uh, I, I can't get my mind around why the increase is as large as it is. Well, I can say something sensible about the first question. I'm yeah. not sure I can answer your second question. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, the the, the um, uh, employment rates of, uh, of, of older people, whether that be over um, 50 or 60 or 70, uh, matters enormously. Um, and we are finally um, seeing a process through which employment rates of people over 65 are growing and growing really significantly. And actually, we finally got to a point where uh, we've got more men, higher proportion of men aged in their late 60s at work now than was the case in the early 1970s. But we're not there among men in their early 60s. So it's still the case, despite the fact this huge increase in longevity and this huge increase in, uh, in healthy longevity, that men aged between 60 and 64 are less likely to be in work now than they were in 1970, which is just astonishing. Uh, it's just a sort um, But as I say, we are moving in the right direction and have been for a, a, a little while there. And actually, this is another a, another problem in part related to the structure of um, pensions, and particularly occupational pensions. If you've got a defined benefit pension, and certainly historically, it's been very much the case that there's a very clear retirement date, often 60, or if not 65, um, and, uh, and little incentive to carry on working beyond um, uh, beyond that date. If you've got a defined contribution pension, which most people in the future will have, it'll be very, very clear what the incentive is to carry on putting money into it and to carry on uh, working. So I think the incentives around that will change, as has the legislation in terms of not having a compulsory retirement age um, and so on. So I think things are moving in the right direction there. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. In the long run, we need more of that. Now, there are clearly issues around, um, around uh, you know, People like you and me may be very happy to carry on working till we're 70 or 80, but we're relatively lucky in the types of work that we do. There are others who are uh, less keen um, on doing that, but that may nevertheless be something that needs to uh, that needs to happen. Well, you know, I think it is something that will need to happen, and uh, the signal of the increasing state pension age is, 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 is going to be important in that. When it comes to, um, you know, why, why has the price of housing gone up so much? I mean, I mean, there's lots of things that have happened over the last 30 or 40 years. It's been going on for quite a while. Clearly, part of it was the liberalisation of lending policy and so on um, in the 1980s. Part of it has clearly been uh, a lack of supply relative um, to demand, particularly in areas like London and South East, where it's most demanded. It's been least um, supplied. I really do think that significantly it's to do with the kind of ridiculous tax system that we have, which absolutely makes it difficult for people to move. And absolutely, all the signals are, you know, stay in your big house, don't sell it. So the supply, um, so the supply is restricted uh, for that reason. And then most recently, of course, when interest rates are so very low, uh, then that, uh, that, 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 that keeps asset prices up. Now, whether that's enough to explain the scale of the increase, I doubt. But I mean, those are clearly all, all elements to it, but I don't have a, a model which tells me how much is which. 